Okay. You come out from behind the curtain. I, mean, I was looking at my notes. I mean, we actually we we um we put some work into this sometimes. Um, so we had notes. So I was just checking about. How are you, Gary? I'm very well, David. Uh, hold on. Let me get my headphones plugged in so I can actually hear through my headphones rather than the uh, the speaker, and that'll make everything sound better. I think. Good. How's you you can hear me. I can hear you now. Right. Yes. Cool. Right on. Hey, and so. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, again. Our, uh, I think, ninth week. Wow. Big downstream and uh, a lot going on in the world. Friday nights, we still um, do our thing here and uh, bring you a couple hours of joy, we hope. Um, yeah. So thank you. Yeah, joy is especially needed right now. Uh, and that is uh, reflected in the events of the past couple of weeks, especially. And we are addressing that through our beneficiary tonight, the American Civil Liberties Union uh, and uh, Solidarity Fund that the Grateful Dead have established with the American Civil Liberties Union. We'll talk about that uh, in a moment mm -hmm. more in depth with our guest, who I know will be eager to talk about this. Uh, but let's tell folks briefly about the music we have. I am wearing my Howlin' Wolf in a Grocery Store t-shirt. Um, I don't know why Howlin' Wolf is in a grocery store, but I love it. Um, Man, man's gotta eat. I guess, and, and he was a large man, so I, I don't know if he was doing a promotion for the grocery store, but it's 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 a great picture. Yeah. Been, Carol's been very fond of it. And I, I can't see yours. What do you got? I've got the Algonquin Park, Ontario, Canada. It's a, a place that's very dear to me. I uh, won't be attending or visiting there this summer, as, as many of us won't be. But, um, yeah, it's a great place in Ontario. Lots of moose. Lots of moose. Always good. Uh so uh, anyway, I, th I wore this because one of Hal and Wolf's most famous songs or written by Willie Dixon associated with him, with the wolf, is featured in tonight's presentation, which is July 7th, 1989, JFK Stadium in Philadelphia, the last ever event at JFK Stadium with a, it was a heck of a building. I was fortunate to attend this show. I was 18 years old and it was huge stadium a lot of people, and it was a wonderful night of music. When we put out the Buffalo show, uh, which was the previous show on July 4th, 89, when we put that out on DVD and CD many, many years ago, almost 20 years ago, the contender up against it was this JFK show, which we're very happy did come out several years later. Uh, but it's that good of a show that um, it's been like high, high on our kind of archival release list, and we were happy to do it about a decade or so ago. Um, it's a wonderful night of music. Some, as Gary says, there's some really good music in this one. Uh, the first set is spectacular, widely considered probably the best version of Blow Away that the Grateful Dead ever performed, Brent Midland, um, and the second set is, is uh, unbelievable. Yeah, uh, I was not at this particular show, but about a year earlier, I was at JFK Stadium for the, I believe, the launch concert of the Amnesty International mm -hmm. Conspiracy of Hope Tour, an extraordinary tour with Bruce Springsteen, Sting, Peter Gabriel, many others. And the place was already falling apart a year earlier. Uh, this literally happened, the, the Crimson, White, and Indigo show literally happened days before the stadium was condemned. It was already in the process of condemnation. I believe there were sections of the stadium that were like deemed unfit for human habitation. Like they had yep. to, so it was it was really on its last legs even a year before. Yep. It was a huge stadium. It was home for many years for the Army Navy game. Right. Uh, so I think its capacity was. Like it was not 90. 90. It, was, yeah. it was, yeah. And it was right beside the Spectrum and the, uh, the Phillies um, stadium uh, right. memorial, and it's uh, it's a really it's a cool complex. But it was, I mean, it was a it was a phenomenal looking building. It looked it was looked old and a lot of brick, and it was long. It was uh, it was one of these. It wasn't a bowl, you know those ones with the overhangs. It wasn't right. that, so it sounded really good. There was nowhere to bounce the sound off the back wall, so it was a great place. Exactly. It was a dump, but it was a great place. Right. <laughs> so we are going to get to that uh, in a little while, but. Right now, we are very excited to bring in a very, very special guest, a dear friend and uh, a valued member of our musical family. He really is. He's uh, in, in our musical world, and I mean in the Grateful Dead world, but in the greater, as, as they say, the jam band world, this guy is royalty. This, um, this next guest, uh, Aquarium Rescue Unit uh, founder and, and a great band, and then the Allman Brothers for almost 20 years, 
and then a founding me member of Dead and Company, and one of the nicest people you're ever going to meet. So, Gary, bring him in. Very happy to introduce our friend, Oteil Burbridge. Oteil. Namaste. Hey, so, thank you for joining us. So good to see you, my friend. You see my buddy in the background? We love yeah. him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's awesome. <laughs> Family. <He's cool. laughs> yeah. I love it. So, man, have been missing you so much, especially in this season. You know, I had hoped to see you first at Jazz Fest, um, and then that got pushed back to October, and then that got canceled, and then Dead & Company Summer Tour got canceled. Like all live music for perhaps the entire remainder of 2020, this has had a tremendous impact on all of us as a community, uh, on the careers of musicians, on so many things. And uh, tell us a little bit about how it's been affecting you. I mean, you know, it's just, uh, it's it seems now like one thing and it's a, a series of dominoes. So, you know, whereas it kind of occupied more of my mind space and it's always looming like a dark cloud overhead, you know. No one can really say when we're gonna go back at all. Right. right, when or if at this point. Yeah, and you can project and we can all hope and whatever, but nobody's like stuck a pin in anything and don't even know when we're going to stick a pin in anything. Mm -hmm. So it's weird, but I've gotten a lot more time with my kids, um, a lot more time with Jess. Uh, I haven't, yeah, I try to look at the silver linings of it. But uh, it's just the dominoes, you know, it's just mm -hmm. like everything, you know. I'm thinking as much about just general unemployment mm -hmm. and, you know, all those kinds of things. You know, all the women walk, locked, uh, just knocked out of the workforce because if they're single moms, you mm -hmm. can't put your kid in daycare and you can't go to work anymore. Like, it's just, there's so many things on my mind that I, that's just one of them, mm -hmm. you know. So I just try to literally... I'm not even taking it a day at a time. I'm taking it uh, an hour at a time or a minute at a time, you know. I'm yeah. Doing some wild swings, man, <laughs> you know, emotionally. <laughs> you you are so not alone in that. I, I think every yeah. one of us have experienced that, have felt this disconnect. I'm glad you were with your immediate family. We felt a disconnect from our families and friends in, in many, many ways and from our colleagues and from our coworkers. Uh, and, you know, we, as if the coronavirus crisis wasn't enough, you know, we established this as a way of bringing our community together to share our love of music and all that in the face of that crisis. Uh, and we were supporting and continue to support charities that address that, uh, charities that are giving money to musicians, cha charities that are providing medical aid, all sorts of things like that. And then when we couldn't have even imagined that something could take focus off of that, we had what happened in Minneapolis and has happened in many places mm -hmm. to many African Americans for far too many years. The most, only the latest was the murder and we'll call it a murder of George Floyd. I call it a lynching really, you know, I, but, you know. Yeah, absolutely. A modern one. You know? Right. So we have chosen as our beneficiary tonight, and it's interesting, we were already talking about, before this happened, we were talking about addressing things like voting rights, which are also going to be affected by the coronavirus, people being able to go to the polls or being able to vote by mail or being able to get absentee ballots as easily as they should. And then George Floyd happened, and so our focus switched immediately to what I think is the best beneficiary possible, which is the American Civil Liberties Union. For sure. That's mm -hmm. a timely one, right? Yeah. yeah, which is 100 years old this year. Wow. Uh, you know, and started in the era of people being arrested for being anti-war during World War I. Mm -hmm. um, they made one of their first national splashes by representing the defendant in the Scopes monkey trial in Tennessee, nice. a man who is being tried for teaching evolution in the schools. And does, doesn't that sound familiar given, you know, some of the theocrats who are trying to 
run America now. So this has been a long, long struggle. The ACLU has been in the front lines of it all along. And now they are in the front lines of the struggle for justice for you know, all victims of police brutality, of um, suppression of the vote, suppression of free speech and dissent and demonstrations. You know, and we are in a situation where prominently placed people are saying, call in the armed forces to quell dissent in America. You know, it's a scary time. So the ACLU is who we're supporting tonight. And the way you do that, if you look at your YouTube screen where this is all running, there's a blue donate button. If your screen is opened up all the way, it should be to your right. It'll say Grateful Dead ACLU Solidarity Fund. And we ask you to push that blue button. If you are logged on to YouTube, if you have a YouTube account, it's quite possible you've already like registered your credit card number, uh, but certainly your name and address. It's a very easy process to donate. And as we say every week, if you've only got a dollar, if everybody watching here kicks in a dollar, that'll be a lot. Two dollars even better, five dollars even more. And if you are in a position in these financially strained times to donate more, they ain't going to turn it down. So, And it, everything helps, as Gary says. And we've, um, in our nine weeks doing this, you, the people watching, have raised a lot of money for a lot of extremely important causes, especially what's going on right now. So please, um, if you can, that'd be great. We know it's hard times. So if you can't, we understand that too. So anything is, is very helpful. Yes. And also, there's you, know, you can get more information about the ACLU. Uh, we have links in our description below, below the screen um, where, where you're watching this video. There are some links uh, where you can get more information as well as hitting that blue donate button. Um, and we encourage you to educate yourself to find out how you can help, not just through donations, but through action. Becoming an ACLU member is a great idea um, because they will keep you informed as to actions you can take as a citizen. And this is about citizenship. It's not about politics. So what else do you want to talk about, Otiel? <laughs> As I'm saying, guys, boy, don't leave it up to me because we'll be right back to politics. Right? Yeah, I know. I, I know. We'll we'll try to we'll try to uh, you know provide some balance here. Well, we, um, can, we can leave in and out. Um, but uh, so Otiel, so uh, apparently you're in a band, um, and you're an incredible band, and you're an incredible part of this band. Um, you know, I've spoken with so many deadheads uh, who have been seeing Dead and Company now five years. And uh, a lot of them have met you. Uh, you're universally considered one of the nicest guys in this business, um, or a nicest guy anywhere anyone's met. Um, so I guess you're missing the deadheads as much as they're missing you, uh, because they really are. They, I've got a lot of messages today since we announced you were coming on. Uh, they really miss you. And I'm guessing that you've developed a, a big connection with the fans. Yeah, I have, you know, and it, it, uh, it really keeps me going. It really does. I remember I was kind of joking, I guess, but not really with uh, <clears throat> Matt Bush and uh, saying like, you know, um, the way with unemployment and everything like collapsing, you know, like people are just going to have to turn to each other to help and start, you know, if you're out of a job, then start making something. And I was like, it's kind of like Shakedown Street, like mm -hmm. the whole world or our whole country, a lot more of it is going to be on Shakedown Street. Mm -hmm. And uh, which, you know, it's kind of funny with the title of this show. <laughs> and uh, I was like, you know, deadheads are uniquely uh, adapted and prepared for this new normal that everybody else is totally not prepared for it mm -hmm. you know, because they just opted out of society they didn't dig a long time ago and just depended on each other and the kindness mm -hmm. of each other to get to the next show and you know slinging grilled cheese or what you know just like what do you have to offer the community mm -hmm. and uh so i you know i i went into it with that in mind like okay you know you're going to be good, you know, and we're going to be good. All of us will be good if we just continue to stick together. So it's something that I have mentioned to a few other people that are 
not dead. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, in addition to what you say about people being prepared in that self-sufficient way that people have, the deadheads have, have behaved on the road and on tour and all that. I think the deadhead community was also prepared in a way for this isolation because communicating on the internet was something integral to the Grateful Dead community very early on. You know, like there, there were Grateful Dead chat rooms before most people knew what a chat room was, you know, and also they are seeking out the music that way. You know, they are finding their favorite bands who are doing these great little from home performances, you know, and, and so many of the bands have stepped up, not just Grateful Dead, but Dead and Company have their One More Saturday Night series. Um, Fish. Bob, yeah. Bob, Bobby has Weird Wednesdays. Fish yeah. has dinner and a movie. Yeah. Joe, Joe Russo's Almost Dead have been doing things. So it's not a bad time to be a deadhead stuck at home. <laughs> you know, if you're going <laughs> yeah. to be stuck anywhere, you're going to have plenty of input and plenty of chance to communicate with with your peers and your your brethren and sistren. Yeah, if we had done this, if this had happened 30 years ago or 40, man, it <laughs> screwed yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, so we have a bunch of great questions uh, from fans. And, and it's funny, a lot of them are resonant with things that I plan to ask you because uh, we got some smart fans out there. Uh, so, uh, uh, David, should we take on the questions that were intended for us first and then uh, jump on to OTL or? Yeah, for sure. Um, I saw one that was came through for me. There was one, uh, there was a few for you. Uh, Gary, why don't you go ahead and uh, take one that was directed to Gary Lambert? Okay, well, this this one was, was adaptable to both of us, I guess. Uh, let, let's take this one first. What was the weirdest show both of you have attended? Uh, and it said that could either be for the set list or just a general scene. You have one, David? Uh, you know, for me, I can say for sure it wouldn't have to do with set list, uh, only because I was I'm I was firmly a believer that it wasn't what they played. It's how they played it. Mm -hmm. it. The best shows I saw had the most, I don't want to say mundane set lists, but, you know, straightforward, nothing too out of the way. And then sometimes when they took those chances, when they really tried some weird stuff, it didn't work very well. Um, strangest show, probably in Paris, France, a uh, small place, about a uh, 6,000 seat uh, venue, which for the dead in 1990, when, you know, they would sell out everything in America at 18,000, 20,000 stadiums, like we're going to see tonight with, 60,000 or more um, to see them in a venue of 6,000 when probably 80% of the fans were Americans and the other 20% were French people who didn't know what was going on. Um, <laughs> that was pretty weird. And to see the French people in the hallways during the show, I went through the hallways a couple times and to see them uh, watching the dead head spinning in the hallways that was pretty trippy because they'd never seen anything like this. And it was a small venue too. It was a big uh, blimp, a bubble. And uh, that was pretty cool. About 5,500, 6,000 seat place in Paris was uh, very weird to see the French reaction to the Grateful Dead. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, for me, I will say they were all weird and that's why I kept coming <laughs> back. But uh, I will say, I won't particularize it to one show, but one of the weirdest runs, Capitol Theater, February 1971, a great run because the Grateful Dead premiered seven new songs that became absolute cornerstones of the of the repertoire. But also in the course of that, there was an ESP experiment in which audience members were asked to look at slides being projected above the stage and transmit them to people in laboratory, in a, a sleep laboratory in Brooklyn. And I forget where the other subject was. And I understand there were mixed results. I never got a definitive answer on whether they got those pictures in their mind. Another night, there was a bomb scare, which was probably phoned in by someone without a ticket outside because they evacuated the Capitol Theater for I don't remember exactly how long. Capitol Theater held 1,800. And then when they let people back in, I'd say there were conservatively 3,500 people yeah. in that venue. <laughs> and, uh, and, and there was also a big night where there was a big dosing, but I won't go into that. But there was na there were naked dancers and all kinds of things. So a wonderfully weird run. Okay, should we go to a question for Oteil? Yes, um, I you know there was a lot of there were a lot of good there are a lot of good questions um, and and one that there were several variations on this one um, is Oteil uh, a couple of years pretty much into the Dead and Company's run you started singing and you started singing quite a few songs. 
beautiful songs, If I Had the World to Give and, and China Doll and songs like that. And this question came in a few different ways of how receptive was the group to you singing some of this, uh, some of these songs and were you the one choosing them or was it somebody, was it a band member or management suggesting, hey, this is this fits O'Teal's voice because you're playing, you've made them your own almost from the moment you first played them. I, I've heard each of the first versions of everything that you've sang and they're yours. Um, so curious about this. Well, initially it, it's like kind of a, a little bit of all the above. Initially we were doing um, my favorite song at the time was China Doll out of all of them. So when it came up in rehearsal, I was like, oh, yes, you know? And so we're playing and playing and playing and nobody steps up to sing. And finally, I think Bob paused everybody and was like, <clears throat> John, do you want to take this one? And he said, well, you know, that's, there's this, you know, after his vocal surgery, there's a little band that he can't hit. He can sing above it and below it. But so he bounces around it and you don't really notice it that much, mm -hmm. you know? if at all. And then um, Bob was like, for whatever reason, he really didn't want to sing it, you know? And so I'm just watching China Doll fly away. I was like, no, it just, you know. So I was like, guys, this is like right in my range. I'll be happy to sing it, you know? I just stood up and I, you know, my heart was beating a little fast, but I figured, you know, what the hell, you know? And it was just cricket so i was like okay never mind i'll let it go and then i forget i think it was matt bush that told me um if you want to let them hear you do a song just step up to the mic and start singing it mm -hmm. in rehearsal when there's a lull or whatever and i was like really he said yeah it's just that's the grateful dead if somebody yeah. starts everybody just falls in even if they're in another room you know and so I did. I was like, I told Kamini, I said, hey, man, can you play this with me, just you and me, just so I can hear if I've really got it anyway, you know? And so this is much later, I think, year, you know, a year or two. I don't know. Yeah. Dead has no better when I sang my first China Doll. Um, and uh, But we were in a rehearsal. I think we were at TRI. I just remember not everybody being in the room. It had to be TRA at that point. And um, so he's like, sure, you know, he's always <laughs> willing. And he, we just started playing it. And then, you know, Bob came in, Bill came in, Mickey came in, Jockey, you know, everybody just started playing it, you know. And I don't know if John even, well, no, we had, we had run over it before, but we had, like, continued to do it. And then... By the time we got to the end of the song, they were like, okay, well, we should do that, you know? And I was like, Matt Bush, nice, thanks, dude. He was like, just start, you know? And then he was the one that told me about Comes a Time, mm -hmm. you know? And then different fans, you know, and friends who are longtime deadheads, of course, blew up my cell phone. Man, I think you should sing this, yep. this and that. And I, you know, some of them, I was like, uh, Bob's already singing that one. And right. Singing that one, like, let's not get carried away, you know? <laughs> well, I, I remember, I don't know if I can take credit for this because I don't know if you retained it or someone else suggested it later, but at Fenway Park on the first summer tour, we were hanging out and I asked you, uh, I said, you know, it'd be a good song for you to sing uh, if I had the world to give and you'd yeah. never, you, you'd never heard the song. And I said, last song on the Shakedown Street album, only performed by the Grateful Dead four shows. It's a total rar rarity. So uh, maybe, maybe give that one a listen. So uh I'm so glad you because at what you know when that was happening, I was literally writing stuff down immediately. I think you wrote it down there. Yeah. Yeah, I still have a file in my phone of like songs that I gotta get to still. Yeah. I was doing a lot of Jerry Band ones because I was doing those with my band and I knew I wasn't gonna get to do it with Dead and Company. But I've learned a bunch of those. Uh I sing a lot more of those than I do probably than with Dead and Company, you know. Okay. Uh, oh, I'll, I'll give you credit for that one, dude. <laughs> all right, man. I'll, I'll proudly accept it. <laughs> um, so uh, let's see. Uh, oh, uh, you know, I've got, uh, one that was I found really interesting, and this, again, came from a few people because of the bands you've played with. But And this is interesting. What lessons uh, – it talked about, you know, uh, Aquarium Rescue and the structured nature and the almonds 
maybe not quite as structured and dead and company maybe a lot less structured so it was kind of the bridge of of what lessons from colonel bruce hampton have you brought to dead and company actually colonel bruce taught me more about the unstructured ones because he just liked to go mm -hmm. out there he was like detune all your strings and see if you can still keep it interesting <laughs> or you know Let's play in three different keys and see if we can make it mean something. And it's not just nonsense, you know, like, can you mean it? Like, can you find something, whatever it is, even if it's embarrassment or funny or what, whatever it is, you know, and, um, and that comes from it, but we had structure too. It's like Sun Ra. Sun Ra was, you know, <laughs> as out there as you could get, but they also had like, you know, five page charts for mm -hmm. two. Right, so, Sun, Sun Rock came out of the big band tradition originally, and new like yeah, written, Fletcher written, Harrison. yeah, all that stuff. So, uh, so well, I, you know, but the real thing for me, uh, besides that, was, you know, my dad was is really a musicologist, and he had everything. He had Porter Wagner records and just like mm -hmm. stuff that the most off the wall, Ema Sumac and Christoph Pendereski, and just you name it. There wasn't anything. He didn't know about or have just out of curiosity mm -hmm. but he didn't really know about old blues like delta blues and chicago blues he was in the bb king um but you know bebop was his thing mm -hmm. and this was an era again when you know black people are being told that they're not you know they're less than, they're not capable of, you know, and and then here he comes up after the Harlem Renaissance and it's like, you know, just this flowering of jazz. So like jazz, like classical cats were coming to see jazz, you know, the composers. Stravinsky, yeah, going to see Charlie yeah. Parker, yeah. You know, yeah. And so he was like, that was his pinnacle, you know. So he had that kind of blind spot. In fact, I remember I turned my dad on to Howl and Wolf. So you got on your shirt. Mm -hmm. He had never heard Howl and Wolf before. And I was like, wow. It was backstage at an Allman Brothers show. I have a picture of it. I was like, I turned my dad on to something he hasn't heard before. Whoa. You know, and but Colonel Bruce taught me about all that stuff and the old bluegrass, which in the old country. And so now I got the complete American story. I had the gospel, I had the New Orleans, I had the funk, I had the jazz, you know, uh, I had R&B, soul, you know, I had all that stuff. But this part of the American story, I didn't really have. And Colonel Bruce taught me that. And it was because of that that I think I was able to do the Almond Brothers gig. Because if you don't know that part, yeah. you can't. And same with the Grateful Dead. Yeah. I, if you don't have that root thing, that mm -hmm. the root American roots all mm -hmm. the way back to the beginning, then you know. So he really prepared me for both gigs. Yeah. yeah. Well, this ties in nicely because you were talking about how African Americans were made to feel less than and excluded from the mainstream of American culture. So we've had several questions like this, and I'm really happy to see them. Obviously, we have an overwhelmingly majority white audience here, but one of the benefits of this horrible time is that white people have been asking themselves, yeah, how can I be an ally? How can I help? And uh, Patricia was one of them. And she said, <clears throat> Otiel, thank you for your posts <clears throat> on Instagram and pictures of your family making posters and attending the protests. You stated it took you a few days to figure out what you wanted to say. How are you and your family doing? And what do you feel comfortable saying now? How can Deadheads help? Well, um, thank you. And me and my family are doing great. It's really interesting. <laughs> right before we got here, um, the doorbell rang. And I said, Jess, did you order some food from the grocery store? She was like, no. And I am not expecting anybody like, you know, and so Nigel ran for the door because when he hears the doorbell, and I was like, no, nah, get away from the door, get away from the door. I just had a feeling, you know, and I was like, okay, don't be dark about this. You know, I went to the door and I opened the door. It's a police officer. And I'm like, in my pajamas, you know, and uh, just like, the, and I was like, hi. And he's like, hi, he's trying super hard to be nice. Because, you know, this is not a predominantly black neighborhood. 
Right. So I opened the door in my pajamas. He's like, hi, sir. He's like real cool. And he hands me a subpoena. Now our cars, our Jess's car got broken into a, a long kind of while back. And so we have been told we might receive a subpoena to go or it, it might go away or whatever, you know. So I wasn't worried that it was for us. But it was just weird. Like right before this, I opened it. Uh, somebody rings my doorbell unexpected. It's a cop. Now, you know, I got a legit reason to be scared because, mm-hmm. you know, Brianna got, oh, yeah. I can't yeah. even go there. So, I know, I know. You know, and having to tell my son, like, uh-uh, get away from the mm-hmm. door. And I was like, man, we're here already. And then I opened the door and it was a police officer. Like my, my spidey senses weren't wrong, mm-hmm. you know? So it's weird and it's going to be weird. And having to talk to my five-year-old about, slavery and <laughs> racism which how's he gonna get it he's got a black dad and a white mom he's like right. he's got enough critical thinking already to be like i don't get it and i'm like exactly he's like that doesn't make any sense i was like exactly so he's like okay that's just and then he goes on because he doesn't realize the gravity of it but it came up and he asked and i told him he was like that's stupid, right? I was like, yeah, <laughs> peaced out on it, you know. But a lot of people have been asking me this, you know. And so I do have some things you could actually wrote them down. I hope people don't mind because I wrote these down before this, you know, to talk to even family, you know, white family. And I have another one to talk to black family about. <laughs> you know? Right. Sure. So, I don't know how much time we have. I'm we're supposed to go like like a half hour in. Yeah, it's not long, but you know. Sure, man. Things. So, the first thing was consider for a minute what the music of the Grateful Dead would be without Black American mm-hmm. influence. Oh, yeah. Like we should do this as an exercise. Let's take every song with the slightest bit of black american influence and crossed it off the set list and then see how many songs were short mm-hmm. uh, yeah and you'd have to start with the your the name of, you'd have to rename this stream mm-hmm. that's right that's right. right lose the name of this very yep. stream. because that's funk the yeah. song on, that we play. that's where i get my booty on Mm-hmm. You know, so someone, some another, another reader asked about your your funk influences. We may not get there tonight, but let's, uh, yeah, keep keep talking well, about they're, that. They're all the ones that you would expect, you know. Right. And they're all the ones that inform the great, you know, mm-hmm. the same ones Jerry was into the rest of the guys, you know. Right, but also but, um, gen- generationally, you bring in new stuff. Jeff brings in new stuff. John brings in new stuff that the other guys may not have been aware of when they were coming up. So you help inform them too. Yeah, but you know, we're all, I think me and John and Jeff are here because we're all into the old stuff. Sure, sure. You know, that's what I've realized from going to Colonel Bruce to the Allman Brothers Band. Like a lot of the stuff that I grew up hearing because of my dad and embracing because I was a musician since I was five. I'm a drummer, really. And um, I studied that music. So I knew how incredibly difficult it all was so i'd never rejected my dad's music so we're into the old stuff you know like i really don't know about the new stuff Mm -hmm. actually i'm learning about it now you know but um the other thing there's another thing i would say you know um there's people out there that you can find so easily because of the internet and youtube and just search engines and there's a couple of people I think you should really check out. One is uh, Professor Cornell West. Mm-hmm. This guy is just the most intelligent, the most spiritually awake and committed, the most eloquent, the most fearless, prominent black leader going today mm-hmm. for my money. And I can hear him speak for he, he gets me in the first 15 seconds and I'm feeling better. Even in, with my pain, I'm feeling like, yes, we're going to mm-hmm. take this pain and this is what we're going to do with it, you know. But the way he contextualizes it, you know, 
and he mentions the names of the people all the time. People like Fannie Lou Hamer, you know, so I go get a couple of audiobooks about Fannie Lou Hamer. I watch YouTube of Fannie Lou Hamer. She's saying the same thing mm -hmm. that they're saying now, man, all the way back there when TV was black and white. So, you know, go out. It's a lot easier to educate yourself now, right? But I'm giving you a door that you can walk through. Go to the Cornell West door, and through that door, you're going to find just trails underneath that, you know, down in that rabbit hole that go, that just fan out. And then you'll know, because now all this stuff is on video. They know now that we weren't, you know, making the stuff up, you know, like it's, you're catching it all on video. Mm -hmm. And so now that we're all clear, finally, after all this time, go back. And listen to what the people were saying back then. Listen to what Cornell West and his compatriots are saying now. Chris Hedges and Naomi Klein and all these, you know, there's a bunch of people. You'll see him when you click on his YouTube that other people sit with and then click on their YouTube, mm -hmm. you know. So I would say that. Another guy is Dan Carlin. He has a, po a, a uh, podcast called Hardcore History, which is like long form podcasts, like four four hour podcast on the fall of Rome and I'm just a geek about that stuff, you know. But I like to see how societies repeat the same thing. And um but he also has another podcast called Common Sense, which deals with current issues, which he took a long break from when Trump got elected because he was like, I just don't even know anymore. Like hmm. I just have to wipe the chessboard clean because I don't you know. But um and he always said, he said the one thing throughout history when it seems like all is lost a wild card gets dealt out of the deck onto the table and just something you could never see coming. He's like, every time, whether it's Genghis Khan or the fall of Rome or Germany or what, you know, whatever it is. Right. And then what happened? Pandemic. We couldn't see it. You know, I had a file called tipping point because I've been talking about this, that this is what happened for like three years to my wife. And then two years, I started talking to my friends about it. And they'll probably, they may get on this chat and go, yep, yeah, okay, tell me this for two years. Someone was going to have a file in my phone. I could post, I should post it. Tipping point scenarios that would cause the economy collapse, which would cause unemployment to go up, which would cause so much violence because we have so many guns here. Pandemic was not on the list. No. <laughs> you know, <laughs> It's like, you know, eight, nine other things. That, but there's the wild card that Dan Carlin was talking about. And I was like, the wild card. Mm -hmm. And I talked to my friends about the wild card. I hope they post on the chat. Yo, Teal told me about the wild card. So check out Dan Carlin. This guy's really heavy. Um, another thing, I want to take a lot of time, you know, too much. But please realize the difference between protesters and criminals. Yes. Mm -hmm. Protesting is not illegal. Looting and killing people and maiming people and, you know, uh, arson, th those are crimes. Criminals are like leeches. They use a crisis to do their thing. Just like the elites do that. Mm -hmm. Naomi, Klein, Naomi Klein has a book called Shock Doctrine about this very thing. You take advantage of a crisis. Oh, we got 9-11. Okay, let's do Patriot. It's going to be temporary. Oh, but then it never goes away. It yeah. never goes away. Obama didn't even make it go away. Right. right? So if once these things happen, now you see with the new surveillance to track the mm -hmm. coronavirus, well, that will be used against people for the protest. They're doing, you know, so we, we're going to institute these new things and they never go away. You know, it's like... And if, if I may add... It's also an indication of the inequities with which protest is dealt with, because a few weeks ago you had people with guns storming the state house in Ohio, screaming into the face of cops from like inches away and without consequence. Mm -hmm. And then a few days ago in America, we have a protest over an African-American killing involved and the protesters were both black and white. And they're being tear gassed away for a photo op. And they are even, being, even yeah. equally as relevant, if not more, is the fact that those people protesting at the state capitol, the white protesters about, you know, you can't make me wear a mask, you can't make me stay home, right. are now 
gonna tell protesters, you need to stay home or we're gonna shoot you. What happened when you can't tell me not to stay home? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. There's no consistency whatsoever. It's a complete double standard. You know, so, you know, let's not conflate the two though. And we shouldn't conflate good cops and bad cops. Exactly. Right? Although s- silence. Like waking up being a good cop these right. days. It'd be like right. waking up being a good cop in Mexico almost, you know? Right. Not quite that bad, but. Silent yeah. cops are a problem too, though. Cops who don't brutalize, but keep yeah, but man, you, yeah. you know, when you get in there, you know, that's black cops. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. like, you know, so, but don't, let's not yeah. feed that, you know right. what I mean? Because that's, they're not, pro, protesters didn't kill anybody. Criminals right. killed somebody. Protesters right. didn't loot. Criminals looted, yes. you know? So mm-hmm. it's, um, that's one thing I would say. I'm sure everybody's heard this meme, but I'm going to say it just in case they did it because I'm tired of hearing it. <laughs> when people say, you know, it's terrible that black guy got kidding, killed, but, you know, the looting's got to stop, you know? And it's like, no, it should be. It's terrible. Uh, there's looting. <laughs> that this looting is going on, but the murder of black people has got to stop. Mm-hmm. You know, an insurance policy is going to bring back the windows, the merchandise, if you burn the whole building down, mm-hmm. the building is going to come back from the insurance policy. There is no policy that's going to bring George Floyd's life back or any of these countless other people. You know, so don't, man, it makes black people so mad to hear that. And I am exactly the same. It's like you're putting this property when we don't watch the boss from the Boston Tea Party to the Yellow Vets, <laughs> you know. And, they, and now it's like, you know, the Boston Tea Party, you know, I, it, it was a great thing. You know, that was the same thing. Mm-hmm. You know? Vandalism, baby. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, and yeah, it's it's the the double standard is just staggering. And we also have to say that we don't want local merchants to lose their businesses or be looted or anything like but 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 they but they are victims of the same thing because these events explode as a result of this oppressive condition mm-hmm. they are victims the cop who got killed in you know yeah. a few days ago he was a victim not i mean he was a victim of the criminals but the situation created the atmosphere exactly Exactly. There's cause and effect, man. This country's got some bad karma. You can't keep this stuff up all the time. You know, you just can't keep it up for that long. And it's going to, you know, eventually the economic fiction that our market is, is going to reveal itself. You know, the bottom's going to drop. These things, they have a a lifespan. Everything is cycles. Mm -hmm. You can't inhale all the time. So to expect just economic growth constantly is insane, you know. You got to exhale, you know, so there's cause and effect and, you know, people have had enough, you know, people have had enough. All right. There's only a few more things. Okay. Um, we're, we're, we're coming low on time, but if you can squeeze okay. in one more. No, uh, uh, we, um, well, we've got to have you back. Otil. Yeah. You know what? We're going to be doing this for another couple months. Yeah. I would say just a couple of quotes that I heard that really helped me out. Um, And these are just things that I saw scrolling through Instagram. One was by uh, a lady named Tabitha Brown, who's just funny. It got hip to her and Leslie Jordan, that the little Southern gay dude on Will and Grace. He's on Instagram. He's just completely funny. And Tabitha Brown Brown is equally as funny. But I was reading one of her, her posts, and there was just one little line that says, racism is a pandemic. I was like, wow. That was really profound, you know? And on Vernon Reed's Instagram, I'm scrolling by, and he had one thing in the bottom, he said, love is also a virus. And I was just like, all right, you know? But I think about those things and it helps me like balance out, you know, it's my yin and yang. So uh, yeah, that's that's good enough for sure. Yeah, hey, we're told we can extend. We We uh, can? Can you stay 15 minutes? I mean, I'm good. My kids are probably asleep now. <laughs> always, always a plus. Um, well, yeah, I mean, Matt O'Teal, you know, we really could talk about this all night long and just begin <laughs> to scratch the surface. 
Um, but I'm really glad you you had a chance to express these feelings, bring these insights. Um, should we talk about something lighter or do you want to keep going deep? <laughs> Man, it's up to you guys. I mean, it's y'all stream. I don't want to bring everybody down, but I also don't want to like try to avoid it because I hope it really starts that this will be an ongoing conversation. Maybe yeah. it'll be a segment because this is not going away. I mean, we no. can see that this time. They said it's the biggest civil rights protest in history. Like that's significant, man. After yeah. like the apartheid protests, and, yeah. you know, that's mm -hmm. that was a lot of countries involved in that. And for another layer beneath that, the pandemic is not going away either. And that's going to continue to inform mm -hmm. the, the yeah. frustration and anger of people on both sides of the divide. Yeah. And, and so unemployment, unemployment ain't going away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, there's going to be a new reality. The new normal is going to be more like Brazil and India and stuff. And I don't think people are ready for that. I don't think white people are ready for it. No. Like the Haitians around here, they're like, man, we got this, you know, <laughs> but you know, yeah. seriously, like, like there's a lot of white people that are, that's why we have Trump for president. They're like, this is, you know, this is not supposed to be us. Yeah. You know, yeah. and now they're going to be, you know, <laughs> and they're not happy about it. And they got lots of guns, man, you know? So I don't know. It's uh, I hope it needs to be an ongoing conversation mm -hmm. because um, but there's only one way out of it now, you know, there's only one way, and that's through. We literally have to make change. So we don't have another civil war, you know, or whatever this is going to be, it's, you know, getting bad. So, yeah. And, and for those who say we don't want to get into politics, we don't want to talk politics. We don't want politics in the grateful dead scene. There are so many millions of people in this country who don't have that luxury because the politics has a knee, has a knee on their neck all the time. Yeah, mm -hmm. man. Like, and what's not political? Like, you know, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, man. If you're talking about justice, you know, you can't avoid politics, religion, spirituality. You can't you just cannot avoid it. That's I don't man. If we can't talk politics and religion like i ain't really got time grace whatever because i don't have, have time for this man this stuff has got to get fixed yeah you know it will be ashes ashes we all fall down man seriously you know and you can see look what they did to that old white guy i'm sure you saw it that yeah he's in buffalo him. he went out bleeding out his ear you know right before this came on uh my buddy al evans posted on instagram the al evans from soli I think 56 or 57 cops um, all resigned en masse because the two guys that did that got suspended. Without pay, right. Yeah. Incredible. Mm -hmm. 56 or 7? Yeah. Okay, okay. y'all. So look, we got to deal with this, man. I don't care mm -hmm. if you don't want to talk politics. You know what? Yeah. <laughs> Go on, you're gonna get caught in the crossfire. Mm -hmm. You better can, wake up, man. Can I inject something that <laughs> will give a little context here to that aversion to politics? One question we had was tell us more about the Grateful Dead performance at the Black Panther rally that was in March of 1970. And I got a picture of that poster. Yeah, there's very little about that that is known because it was not that well attended. It was not promoted as a Grateful Dead concert. It was promoted as a Black Panther event to the Black community. So the Grateful Dead were kind of a, a square peg in that round hole. But the fact is, the backstory of it is really interesting in that the Grateful Dead met UEP e. Newton on a plane from the Bay Area to New York and got to talking with him. Wow. And Jerry Garcia, who is supposedly apolitical, said, hey, man, anything we can do to help, let us know. And in fact, while they were in New York on that trip, there's a recording you can find. Look up Grateful Dead Alex Bennett Show, WMCA, in September 1970. Let me write this down. The Grateful Dead basically took over Alex Bennett's talk show for an hour and were hilarious and, and brilliant and witty. The whole band was in there pretty much. But toward the end of it, they mentioned meeting Yui on the plane. And toward the end of it, they got into kind of a heavy talk about authoritarianism in America and, and police force being used to suppress 
rights, you know, both in terms of people using recreational drugs and free expression and all forms of, and, and Jerry talked about that. And then Phil said to Jerry, yeah, but who's doing anything about it? And Jerry said, Huey Newton is. Mm -hmm. Wow. And that, le that led to them doing that benefit. So anytime you say, screw this stuff, <laughs> Jerry wasn't political. Jerry had a very complex relationship with politics, but apolitical is not the yeah. right word. So I just well, wanted to throw that in there. He's, for him, it was about justice. Yeah. You can't, so if I can't talk politics, now you say I can't talk about justice. Oh, well, mm -hmm. I, just, I just have to keep on being a slave. Mm -hmm. No, please. This country was built off of slavery, man. And that political deep root that is in the foundation of this, all the bounty that we've enjoyed ever since, you know, is way down in there. And rooting that out may root out the whole system because it still functions that way, mm -hmm. you know? It still functions that way. Yeah, basically. That's why I don't, you know, I, I, I was like, don't call me a progressive. Don't call me a Democrat. Don't call me a socialist. Don't call me any of that. Because those are all systems that have been proven to not work. I mean, some, you know, the progressive thing hasn't really been tried here yet. <laughs> but, you know, my affinity, my, my overlap is more with progressives and uh democratic socialists and libertarians in, some, in a lot of ways because they're really hip to the police state they're really hip to the federal reserve and the economic the you know um but um yeah i mean it's frustrating man it's so frustrating yeah and also also people who think that slavery is something like relegated to the history books because it ostensibly ended in 1865 when in fact that opened the door to Jim Crow and mass incarceration. And of course, you know, black culture being being both appropriated and diminished and, and covered over. Uh, so it's 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 an ongoing thing. It is, and it needs to stop. I think it's stopping right now. <laughs> I hope it doesn't <laughs> like just bring everything, you know, just just we end up in ashes. But I think we're witnessing the beginning of the end of it, you know? So I, I try to be hopeful too. Like, well, you've been waiting on this, you know? We've all been waiting on this a long time. Well, here it is. You know, I wish it was a little more organized, but it still got bigger than any civil rights protest in history. So even disorganized, maybe it's just going off of intention. Like there's the intention that this is wrong and it's unacceptable and, you know, like, um, so I, I hope, I hope that, I hope that it continues and it, you know, it's not going to be all peaceful, but uh, I hope we come out of it the right mm -hmm. way. And I, I think we can, man. Mm -hmm. I think we can. You know, I, when we um, approached you a few days ago or we, whenever it was about being our guest, um, I, I, I don't think we had um, designed to go in this direction in the conversation. I mean, I'm glad we did. And I cannot imagine a more perfect guest uh, right now for what we've been going through. So uh, this has been, I think, for uh, I'm not speaking for all the deadheads out there listening, but very enlightening to listen to you. And I really want to thank you. It's um, this is I, I honestly we've had a lot of good guests on the show for nine weeks and uh We've had a lot of perfect guests for that day, and this was absolutely, you were the perfect person to be on tonight. Thank you. Thank I, I was i was hesitant to do it, you know. And you know, I even said, don't get me started about politics. But then it's like, how do you not talk yeah. about, well, that means we just can't talk about anything. So no. like, what are you gonna do, you know? <laughs> but well, This is good. Well, you know, we're, uh, I, it looks like the concert has, um, has started, so we're not gonna rush over, but okay. uh, we'll head over there. Um, but, uh, we do want to thank you. And we also, as Gary has said, there's the ACLU um, donation button. And, and now more than ever, um, the ACLU is going to help every one of us. Um, it's not just for small groups of people. Uh, I think we all need it right now. Um, so please uh, donate anything. And if you can't, that's okay. But if you can, whether it's a dollar or five or 20, uh, extremely helpful because the ACLU is going to be 
uh, I think, called up quite a bit over the next little while to help with all of it. So uh, please do. And um, next week on the show, uh, we've got a, an unreleased Grateful Dead show from Shoreline in uh, 1991, May 11th, 1991. Uh, it's a Vince Welnick and Bruce Hornsby era Grateful Dead. And we've got a very special guest next week. Um, Gary, do you know who that is? Uh, I think it might be someone relevant to that era. Yeah, that's, 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 a, that's a wild guess on my part. <laughs> it could be. Yeah, I would. Uh, so it's going to be a phenomenal guest. Another one who I know we're going to have another great talk with. So May 11th, 91. Got a wonderful special guest coming up next week. Um, it's going to be a fun one. All right. So our, what are we telling people to go down and click on the button? Uh, yeah, I, think, I think the show's already started. They're probably midway through um, kind of hell in a bucket, maybe heading towards ICO. However, you can go back on YouTube. You can go back to the beginning, I believe. So uh, do that. <laughs> and we're, 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 there was a little timing glitch. Uh, we thought we were going to be able to jump right in uh, at, at the 15, the 45 minute mark. Sorry. But, no, man. No, uh, this, this, this was more important. Yeah. So, uh, Oteil, thank you so much. Uh, we love you. We you. Love send you. we we send love to Jess and Nigi and Kavi and to your entire family. Uh, hope we can see you in person very soon. But if not, we're going to be here for a while. So come on back. <laughs> Definitely, we should do it yeah. more. more. I, we got to find some way to have like an ongoing yeah yeah about this. You know yeah. So I love you guys. And love all you, man. The grateful thank you, Oteil. Not fade away. Thank you all. Thank you. See you, Gary. Bye.